Welcome to a deeper understanding of PostgreSQL execution plan at plan time and runtime. I'm joined by Jobin Augustin, Senior Support Engineer at Percona, who will discuss and demo improvements in Postgres 12's planner, including how to plan changes and behaves. My name is Lindsay Hooper. I'm one of the Postgres conference organizers, and I'll be your moderator for this webinar. A little bit about your speaker now. Jobin is a PostgreSQL expert and open source advocate. He has more than 18 years of working experience as a consultant, architect, administrator, writer, and trainer in PostgreSQL, Oracle, and other database technologies. He has always been an active participant in the open source communities, and his main focus area is database performance and optimization. He is a contributor to various open source projects and is an active blogger. He loves to code in C++ and Python. Jobin holds a master's in computer applications and joined Percona in 2018 as a senior support engineer. With that, I'm gonna hand it off to Jobin. Take it away. Thank you for a great introduction. Uh, so uh, let, let us directly jump into the topic. Uh, today we are going to discuss about uh, the Postgres execution planner in, in, in a bit more detail. And uh, I'm Jobin, uh, working for Percona as senior support engineer, as Lindsay mentioned. So let's get started. Okay, so uh, all of us tends, uh, sends uh, SQL statements to Postgres database as clear text, as an English text string, okay? There are a lot of processing happens in the, on the server side. The first step is lexical analysis, then parsing, so for these things, uh, we use uh, the, the most common things like a flex and bison, which is default in uh, any Linux or Unix systems. And then next stage is analyze, where we analyze the semantics of the SQL statement. Then it goes for the rewrite. The, the statement will be rewritten based on some of the rules. And the next stage is plan and optimize. This is the stage where the entire brain of the Postgres comes into picture. And the final stage is execute. As we can see in the screen, even a select statement has a lot of sub clauses. So we can understand the complexity associated. There is target list, that means the, the values to be returned, uh, into close, front close, where close, and group close, and so and so. Okay, so we'll uh, see things in detail in, in the coming slides. Okay, so let us look at the first parse stage. Uh, what we are seeing in the screen uh, in the right side is the grammar specification of all the statements in Postgres. So we have around 124 types of statements uh, and definitely that's the reason why we, we call Postgres is one of the most uh, advanced open source database in the world because it can handle pretty much every type of uh, SQL statements. So we stick to standards. And the entire grammar specification runs into 16,000 lines of code. So it's, it's pretty complex, okay? And, okay, in the previous screen, uh, uh, is, it will be very difficult to spot the, the select statement because it's uh, somewhere here, okay? And um, even the select statement uh, will be very complex. It has the big close, uh, and uh, select clauses, uh, then word clause, grouping clause, and the entire syntax is so complex. So we can appreciate the complexity associated with uh, the backend processing. And uh, as we can see in the screen, uh, we can see how the parse happens using enabling a parameter called debug print. Turn it on, you, you can see how the, 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 par the parsing happens. But it is only for experts, um, it's not for end user. So since we are going to discuss about the execution plan and explain explain plans, um, not all the statements, we saw around 124 types of statements. Uh, not all the statements are explainable. Only very few set of statements are explainable because they, they are supposed to have the execution plan associated. Uh, for example, if you want to draw a, ta a table or a drop a database, you don't need a execution plan, it's very simple. There is no, no planning required. But when we try to do something meaningful, 
uh, like get, getting that out of some table or joining things or do some transaction it become complex the, that need to be planned so who is going to do this plan uh, before we need to take a decision whether we need a plan or not so we have a concept called traffic cop who decides whether the statement need to be uh, planned or not planned it, it basically splits statements into simple and complex Okay, simple ones, no need of planning. Complex ones, yes, we need uh, planning. So uh, if you can look into Postgres source code, it, it will be very clear, but yeah, that's a lot of complex things. So if, uh, the next stage is analyze. In this stage, the meaning of each statement is identified. Basically the column types, data types, collations, etc., are identified and this stage transforms a parse tree into query tree and for uh, simplicity i mentioned uh, the internal functions here if anyone want to look into the postgres source code please look into these functions it will be clear so it, at the top level we have uh, pg analyze and rewrite inside that we have analyze and then rewrite the query so um in the right in the right side we, i have a screenshot of uh, the, some of the functions no need to go go into details um, basically it takes a parse tree and converts that into a query tree so most of the functions will be named as transform okay so it can, uh, transforms a parse tree into query tree okay. so this uh, the the query rewrite happens after the analyze and in this stage a lot of rules will be applied to the statements so we can create custom rules um, and uh, uh, the syntax also I mentioned in the screen uh, the create rule rule name and what to do okay so this rewriting happens between the parser and the planner and uh, we can create custom rules and there are built in rules as well we are, we are going to see some of the uh, examples okay for example um, when we create a view um, basically it is set of rules so for example uh, postgres has a built-in view called pg settings uh, through which we can get the uh, the settings data this this is nothing but a function call select star from a function call uh, and even if we create a uh, view on a user table it is basically re rewrites that view into a select statement internally so this is what happens uh, so before getting into too much of um, uh, theory uh, i i would like to show some cube demo okay yeah i'm just connecting to uh, a psql prompt and we know we all know that how to see uh, the work mem okay we can say, say show work mem it will show how much work mem memory we have and we can set it using set command for the session, okay? And it is already set to 6 MB. And we can do the same thing using a function call. There is a built-in function called set config. We can invoke that instead of the set command, say like this. So set config work mem 8 MB. So we increase that to 8 MB. Yeah, it's become 8 MB. And instead of show command, we can Query the same thing using PG settings. Yeah, that 8 MB is visible there. It's 8192 KB. And we mentioned that this view, the PG settings is nothing but a function call, built in function call. So we can even do the uh, function call here instead of querying on PG settings. Let's see, let's do that. Yeah, so here we are doing a function call and it is showing the same value. Now the question arises, since this is a view on the top of a function, can we do an update statement? Something like this, update PG settings to set some value. So in most of the places when I asked this question, I got a reply that it won't work because it's a function call. Yes, it shouldn't be working, but in our case, it works because we have a rule. Internally, there is a rule. So let us check whether it is really done. 
yeah, it's increased to 10 MB. And uh, when we look at the role, we can see that uh, there is a rule saying that uh, PG settings U uh, on update to that settings, do a function call, set config. Okay, so this is why the, the update statement works. Okay, so let us proceed. Um, so for example, uh, uh, what about uh, creating a custom view? Okay, let's create a, uh, uh, when we create a custom view, uh, there, is, there is an internal uh, table, internal uh, table where the, the rule will be, the rewrite rule will be updated. Currently we saw the PG rules. Similarly, we have PG rewrite table. So I'm just taking the count of uh, records there. It is 131. And I'm going to create a table and a view on the top of that table. Now, if you look into the, the number of uh, the rewrite rules, one is incremented. It becomes 132. Okay, so basically this, this view created a rule. And um, um, if somebody wants to see what really that rewrite rule is, uh, we can see that using a select statement, something like this. But it is the output will be really complex for an end user to understand. But yeah, uh, somebody who knows the, the, the plan uh, uh, parser statements uh, can understand this. Yeah. Now, basically, what we what we need to understand as an end user is okay. The views are nothing but rules, and we can create custom rules to do uh, manipulate anything. For example, if there is a statement coming and saying that select star from table A, okay, we can create a rule saying that instead of querying on table A, query on table B, and the end user won't be aware. Actually, the query is executing on table B. Hope this is clear, and let's proceed. And next stage is the planner. So we saw the, the what how the rule uh, works, the rule system works. Now we have a very complex um, statement, uh, the, the query tree, which need to be planned. The query uh, tree can be actually executed in a wide variety of ways. Uh, we know from uh, to travel from one place to another another place there could be n number of ways same same similarly uh, to execute one statement uh, there could be multiple ways of executing that so uh, the planner need to identify the shortest uh, or the quickest and the most efficient way of executing the statement so the planner is that intelligence uh, intelligence system okay and how it does is there is a internal data structure called paths. These paths are cut down versions of plans. We talked about the query plan, the, 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 the parser tree, uh, and then uh, query tree. Now we are going to get into the plan trees. So the paths are uh, cut down versions of plans. And from there, the cheapest path is selected. And after all this planning phase, a full-fledged plan tree will be prepared. And how it is prepared is based on cost-based analysis. We are going to see details of that. The last uh, phase of a, a, a SQL execution is executor. So once we have the uh, SQL, uh, the plan, uh, the plan tree properly, we can just execute. The plan nodes are executed recursively from top to down. Uh, and the top node can return the result. Okay, now coming back to the, the plan, because our talk is about plan. Um, few important key decisions are to be made. What scan method we should use, what join method we should use, and the join order. So in the scan method, we have sequential scan, index scan, or bitmap index scan. Okay. In join methods, we have nested loop, hash join, or merge join. And the join order is about which table need to be joined in which order. So the plan, as we mentioned, the 
the plant tree is the uh, is prepared with the cheapest uh, path so the is it can be given to the executor at the end that is that is what the planner does the output is plant tree uh, and for that it considers the the statistics in the table uh, to estimate the cost uh, of the access paths and all. So what Postgres has is a cost-based optimizer and it has an internal generic uh, query optimizer also. So the, the selection is like if there is less number of tables, for uh, in typical case it's a 12, if there are less than 12 number of tables, it goes for a cost-based op optimizer. We can change that parameter. Uh, Otherwise, it will go for a genetic query optimizer because uh, when we have a lot of tables involved in um, in the query, there could be multiple paths. So all the all the combinations of uh, executions uh, analyzing that will be complex. So in that case, it goes for a genetic query optimizer. Okay. So let's do a quick example again. So let's create a table. Okay, um, I'm creating a table with the company ID, company name, and company type, and uh, creating an index on that, and starting a transaction. Uh, uh, then we are going to insert a um, lot of around 5,000 um, companies with the company type one, and just five companies with the company type two and commit the transaction. Now, if you query this table for company type one, we get a bitmap heap scan. And when we query for the type two, there also we get a bitmap heap scan, a bitmap index scan and heap scan. So we know that these values are highly skewed. skewed. Um, we have around 5,000 number of uh, company type one and uh, only very few company type two are existing, but we got exactly same execution plan. And, but say the plan looks same, but if you watch closely, there are a lot of things different here. In the first case, uh, the heap blocks extracted is 28. And in the second case, it has to get only one heap block. And then the, the, the number of rows returned by the index. Uh, in the first first case, it is, uh, sorry, in the first case, it is 5,000 because we have company type one, 5,000. And in the second case, we have only five. So the, the plan is same, but the execution, uh, uh, the complexity of execution was totally different. But why? the Postgres selected same execution plan. So let's ex try executing the same plan once again. Again, uh, the same statement uh, for company one, and this time it is sequential scan. And once again, for company type two, now it is index only scan. So earlier we had bitmap scan and now it turned to be one is sequential scan and another is index only scan so what could be changed by this time so the the, the what really happened is by the time we explain the execution plan explain plan uh, the the background and uh, the the analyzer uh, the, the auto vacuum uh, done the analysis of the table and we got more statistics about the table. Now our plan become more intelligent to take a bit more uh, accurate, uh, better plans. Okay, that's what really happened. So, uh, why this bitmap index scan in the first place? Is it optimal plan? Uh, no, actually the bitmap scans are is kind of a compromise. So uh, it stands in between sequential scans and index scans. So when there is, generally, if we 
uh, see this uh, bitmaps uh, heap scan and index scans happening. Um, most probably the statistics need to be collected or we have a situation where we are in between, really in between. Okay, so that's a smart, uh, it's a uh, smart selection when we don't have much of information and or the information is uh, in, uh, not, not favorable for sequential scan or index scan. So what is that index scan? So to understand this uh, entire stuff, we need to un understand the index scan. So fetch one double point at a time from the index. So as we can see in the screen, the, the blue box is the index from the, it's a P3 index. So it need to be scanned. And then it, then it visits the table and pulls up the, the tuples. This is what happens in normal index scan. And there is one more thing called index only scan. So in that case, we don't have to again visit the table. The information is available in the index itself. So data can be directly pulled out. That's what we, we saw uh, in, in our example. And the sequential scan is scan from one end to the, uh, another, end, uh, another end, discarding all the unmatched rows. That's, that's sequential scan. And the bitmap index scan and uh, heap scan. This is slightly more complex because we need to do the index scan first and uh, get all the data and sort it. Now, once it is sorted and in memory, we, we know what are the heap pages it need to access to get the data. Uh, so the heap pages are visited again. And in many cases, there will be a recheck for, say, because we are getting the, the, the pages, it need to be rechecked uh, to get the final results. So the final result will be given to the client. This is what happens in bitmap index and heap scan. So the advantage of bitmap scan is, uh, we know that the, the, the index is scanned and the data is collected and it is sorted and then goes to the, the heap page and uh, it, it orders the, the scan. So uh, block by block. So it improves the locality reference in, to the table. So it, it, it collects all the, all the information required from one, one block, then goes to an, another block. That, that's really a good thing about bit, bitmap scan. But there is a disadvantage. We need to keep all the information uh, about this bitmap structure in, in memory. So there is, uh, there is a little more overhead in that than other, other scans. Okay, and uh, another side impact is the um, data is uh, not retrieved in the order. Uh, so, yeah, that's another side effect. Okay, so now we talked about the cost and uh, how the how the plan takes care of these things. So, uh, how uh, where, what really happens in the analysis phase? So we we saw that the auto vacuum in the background done the magic. Uh, the auto vacuum gathers this statistics and it stores the information in pg underscore statistics uh, pay, uh, the table and there is a view called pg stats where uh, the users can query and find out what, 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 what is the current information about uh, uh, the table and uh, details like that and um, uh, when we do do the stats collection um, the we generally we do a sampling, right? In, in a bigger population, we do a sampling. So the sample set can be controlled by the next, the parameter defaults statistics uh, target, okay? So we will see, uh, so generally we talk about all these stats and uh, uh, the end user may not be knowing this. So let's see a quick uh, demo about that. Okay, so let's create a small table. Mm. So this is a participant table I created. And um, I'm going to insert um, 10,000 records uh, and uh, another 8,000 records. I'll show you the details. And then I am analyzing. Now we have the stats collected. Now if you query on this uh, table, um, 
we can see that um, it is not equally populated. The state, there is a, in this table, we have state ID and um, city ID. So um, it is not an equal distribution. Uh, for a state one and two, uh, there is a lot more uh, number of cities uh, uh, than rest of the things. So actually state two has more. So when we look, so now we know, okay, state two has around 5,000 plus cit uh, cities in that and uh, state one is having 4,983. 4, but others, other states are having around 2,000 kind of. So now let's look at the stats about this table, okay? Okay, so um, as we can see, okay, let me do one thing. Uh, There are, there are uh, common values. Most common values are uh, taken and its, its frequencies are uh, recorded in the table. So this is what happens when, when we collect the st statistics. So the most common values and its, its frequencies are updated for the city ID column. So we, for, for what are the common city IDs? For state ID, we already saw that state number two and one had maximum uh, number of uh, participants, uh, uh, cities. So this state two has around 27% and state one also has 27% and, and five, six, three are respectively smaller. So we have for, a, we currently we have the statics, statics in the system that uh, state two has maximum number of um, cities, uh, so that the chance of uh, getting a record for state two is higher. So the the filtering and the number of records returned from this table can be calculated based on this stats. Okay, so I hope this is clear. So coming back to uh, the presentation, now we saw. Um, uh, the, uh, what is the stats, stats all about? We have um, most common values recorded and there are uh, other things like histograms and all. We'll talk about that later. Yeah, so it is collected by the uh, auto vacuum worker and uh, it happens in, in the asynchronous fashion in the background uh, while the system is up and running as a background worker. And it results in better execution plan and then we can have a very effective post-based uh, plan system because of this uh, stats. But in the negative side, there is a overhead in collecting the stats and maintaining that. And when, when our uh, sampling site is, uh, size is bigger, uh, it, it is tend to uh, get a lot of data uh, and it, it, it requires a lot of space and um, analyzing that information may be complex. So that's a negative side. Okay. Yeah. So next, the the joint part, uh, nested loop joints. So this is the most simplest thing uh, anyone can do uh, through a loop join the two tables. So uh, the right side relation, the right relation is the right side right side relation is can once for every row found in the, uh, and the corresponding left relation is joined. This works great if the, uh, the if there is index scan possible in right relation because if that, that become more efficient because every right side relation need to be joined with the left side. So that's a, the uh, explain execution plan where we'll select this next uh, loop join in such conditions. And next is hash joins. These are very good for EQ joints. So basically both because the, the values are hashed and joined. So, and it can work, uh, uh, happen in memory. And if the, the records are, uh, the number of records to be joined is small, it can happen in memory. And this is the more, one of the fastest way to join the tables. 
But what happens if uh, the number of uh, records to be joined are not fitting in memory? So it need to be um, it need to be spill, uh, going out. Uh, the, so for it, that's a different strategy there. So uh, the merge join comes into picture. So in that case, the, the results are sorted first and then joined. So uh, here also, it's almost like if you join, uh, and it can create um, temporary files. So if, if there is merge joins, uh, we need to think about uh, are we, are we uh, dealing with a large amount of data? Can we reduce the amount of data uh, in the joins? Okay, so uh, coming back to the cost. So the, uh, as we mentioned, uh, the cost decides the execution plan. Um, and um, uh, so the, the key point is the, the cost, the numbers associated with the cost don't have a unit associated. Um, it is just a number uh, for comparison. So the, when we compare, uh, the value one means uh, the cost of sequentially accessing a page is one. Then compare that with other 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 things. So we don't need a unit associated. Okay. The and we have certain parameters by which we can control the cost. So basically, we need, we, we can say what is the sequential pay, a page cost or random page cost, uh, CPU tuple cost or CPU index cost. The C the sequential page cost is the cost associated with the scanning a page sequentially. And if it is randomly accessing, it is random page cost. And uh, the cost associated with uh, processing the tuple is uh, CPU related cost also. And then their cost is divided into two. It's a, there is startup cost and runtime cost, run, run cost. So all, all these things, uh, say the, the CPU cost as well as IO cost comes in run, runtime cost. And the, the beautiful thing in Postgres is we can tune all these parameters at user level or at session level and even at table space uh, level. So the la uh, I have given a sample uh, create table statement uh, where we specify what is the cost associated with uh, the table space if the table space is sitting on a different type of file system or a different type of storage. So generally we do this uh, for archive data, which is uh, for archival purpose, we put it in a slow disk. Uh, so we, we have a different cost structure for that. Okay, so um, uh, we, we saw the most uh, common values um, uh, letters, st stats, um, and we have a similar similar uh, kind of um, costing model for uh, histogram as well. So let me show you something quickly. So I, I, I uh, dropped and created one table and inserted one uh, set of uh, records and analyzed the table. And now we can see uh, the histogram associated. Now we have around uh, 2000 um, records inserted and it is equally distributed. So um, in the histogram bounds, we can see 1, 20, 40, the, 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 that is equally distributed till 2000. So um, this, the distribution histogram gives a, an idea, okay, how the data is distributed. But what happens if, if we insert a lot more values, like I said, uh, 100 to 1,000 uh, multiple times? And if you analyze, then their uh, histogram changes. Now we have more values from uh, between 100 and 1,000. So we, uh, as we can see in the histogram, those area become more dense. So uh, from one to, um, thousand uh, occupies the most of the uh, the histogram. So this is how uh, the, the histogram is used internally. 
So we, uh, we saw most common values and histograms and the histogram dot font. And uh, in later process, uh, database systems uh, has more extended statics uh, other than uh, the default ones. We can create, we can collect and create more uh, stats. So if there is a city and state, edit, there is a correlation. So we can, if the, there is a dependency between columns, we can have a functional dependency can be defined using a separate stats. So that will uh, give a better idea about the data distribution. And um, we can add uh, uh, the distinct values by, so th this will collect more uh, data about the distinct values. And uh, we have a multivariate uh, um, stats. Uh, this is not just a uh, uh, column level. At a raw level also, we have uh, more data collected. But the, all these things are more advanced. Uh, use it only in cases where it is essential. Because this, this will, all this will create extra uh, data into the system, stats information, which need to be further analyzed. And when it comes to uh, the, the uh, execution plan, another factor which we need to consider is the parallel execution. Okay, uh, and uh, um, we have uh, uh, parameters associated with that. I am not going to getting into details. It it is great for OLAP workloads uh, for complex queries. And another thing is uh, just in time comparison. This is new in Postgres uh, eleven and. Um, by default, it's enabled in Postgres 12, but uh, use it with the caution. Uh, it may not be useful for, for all the cases, okay? Uh, but it, it, the, if there is a, a very complex uh, query, which does a lot of computation, and um, then the expression can be broken into very few uh, functions, then in such cases, JIT shows very good improvement, but not for all. So enable all uh, these things only after testing. And uh, these are some of the cases where uh, it can um, go wrong. As we can see in the right side, in parallel execution, combined with the uh, just-in-time compilation, sometimes it creates a lot more functions. Currently, we can see it's uh, 34 functions. But without parallel, it is just nine functions. So uh, there is no saving. Okay? In, so I, as I mentioned, uh, the parallel execution have a negative impact uh, and in most of the cases general cases turning it off may be the right thing to do unless proven otherwise and so now we understood the entire complexity associated with the, the planning the, the cost and analysis and uh, coming up with a good execution plan and uh, uh, the entire planning uh, the parsing till the plan can be saved uh, by preparing the statement in advance. That's called prepared statements. So as, as I shown in the, the, the diagram part, uh, the right side, uh, we can see the planning took more time and effort than actually executing the query. This is, we tend to see this in the real world. Actually, these numbers are taken from some real world cases. Uh, yeah. So use prepared statement wherever possible. And even, even for a very simple query, like say, uh, select count star from, from, sometimes the planning may take more time than execution. So in such cases, the plan need to be cached. So preparing the entire plan again and again won't uh, be efficient. Just like explain plan, the preparable statements also are very few. So general select, insert, update, delete statements are preparable. Not all statements. So this is an example how how easily we can prepare a statement, prepare a plan name, and the select statement. Then we can exec just execute execute a prepared statement using a parameter. The parameter will be passed in, and it will be executed. So again, quick demo. So uh, we are selecting uh, uh, the company type one. As we know, it's a sequential scan. So now the question is, 
we already know that it, 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 it keeps switching the plan. So it was sequential scan, now it is index scan for uh, uh, company type two. It goes back to the sequential scan again, if, if it is company one. And this is the advantage of planning it at, uh, planning every time. But what happens if there is a uh, prepared statement? So I quit the session and connect it to a new session and prepare a plan. Now, if I execute plan uh, a statement, okay, went for a sequential scan. But now the question is whether it will ch change back to more efficient index scan if the parameter is two. The answer is yes, it switches. So the there is uh, the uh, prepared statement, uh, the last stage of planning is still happening. Uh, even if it is a prepared statement, it switches back to the original plan sequential scan again and back to index scan. So uh, we need to understand this. So lexic analysis, parse, analyze, rewrite, all these things are removed, but final plan and execute is still remaining. So now uh, if we uh, execute that uh, statement repeatedly, what will happen? So again, prepare the statement and execute the same, same statement multiple times, five times. And all the five times it was sequential scan. And now if you execute for the plan uh, for a, uh, with the uh, parameter two, it is not actually switching the execution. It's still showing a sequential scan. So why it is happening? Why it is happening is this one. If the rule is if there is five or more execution, which produces a plan whose estimated cost is more expensive than the generic plan, then the generic plan is selected. So that's, that's the reason why it was not switching the plan in that case. But the reverse won't happen. Say for example, I, I'm quitting the terminal and if I execute for the plan two, it is index only scan multiple times. But if I execute the, uh, for parameter one, it switches back to sequential scan. So, uh, what, why it is happening is the, the, the custom, custom plan for each of these cases uh, is so cheaper than the generic plan. So, it, it goes for the custom plan. So, uh, these concepts, the custom plan and generic plan, it uh, uh, need to be understood when, when we deal with the prepared statements. And the, uh, the, the five times repetition was there before Postgres 12. And in Postgres 12, we can control this. We, we have uh, no need to wait for five executions for a generic plan fix. We can set it uh, for generic plan or for custom plan. Okay, this is the Postgres 12 feature uh, by which we can control the, the behavior. I don't have time to uh, go for demonstration. And another uh, question generally comes in is, um, is uh, we saw the, the prepared statements. Uh, is the functions, the, the PLSQL functions or uh, SQL functions. So in this case, we can, we can see that the same thing is implemented as a PLPG SQL function. And the next one is an SQL function. Uh, is this better or the prepared statement is better? Uh, so uh, the, the thing is, PLPG SQL can handle a lot more complex business logic and it has a lot uh, internal optimizations done. Uh, it can hold prepared statements. So even though the PLPG SQL execution engine is separate, Effectively, in many cases, PLPG SQL engine gives a better result because instead of manually uh, doing that. But definitely, the prepared statements are far efficient because it's cached at the session level. So, if prepared statements are not possible, preferably you may have to look into whether PLPG SQL is better. Um, and uh, the SQL functions are but don't have any any caching mechanism. And generally, we see the uh, poor uh, preparedness. 
but yeah all these things need to be tested in your specific cases but just be aware that these are the options available to be tested yeah so i just mentioned uh, the uh, the plb gc query interpreter parses the function source text and produces an internal binary instruction tree uh, when the for the first time of the function is executed so that, that's why it, it, it speeds up okay and what what is there in um, postgres 11 and 12 uh, when it comes to the dynamic nature of execution plan so um, even after preparing an execution plan at the run time at the at the execution time some of the steps won't be executed uh, as as i highlighted there a uh, few of the scans or a few of the partitions are never executed based on the value based on the uh, the join condition and all it will be skipping and in postgres to, uh, in the uh, uh, postgres 12 case uh, in the bottom uh, slide we can see that uh, in many places the up and uh, stage itself is removed in postgres 12 so it's a smarter uh, way of preparing execution plan so at the runtime as well as uh, at the plan time there are a lot lot more optimization happens with the newer versions of postgres uh, postgres 11 12 and still postgres 13 we have more option to analyze things um, so there is uh, we all know that we can look at the buffers uh, of explain plan uh, during analysis uh, analyze buffers in postgres 13 we have to we have the provision to see how much of effort is there in the planning uh, how much of shared heat happens in planning phase and um, this uh, details will be visible if the format is json and the normal text format will have a single line where, where it is uh, varied with the, with the least information and postgres 13 has a lot more optimizations in terms of uh, planning and execution there are uh, disk based hash aggregation uh, related patches uh, and uh, uh, while generation information also there in the explain plan all these things are new but until it is released uh, there is no commitment yeah Ex these are expected so some of the um, recommendations for uh, uh, future reading uh, and uh, uh, some of the reference i used for this preparation of the slide that's all from my side and thank you for joining thank you all have a nice day. Wonderful. Thank you for such a great presentation. Thank you to all of you for joining us today. And I hope to see you on the next Postgres conference webinar.